Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus this week. I am Trace. Now, if you've been watching DNews Plus regularly, you might notice that I'm wearing the same shirt. Hi, I, I don't wear this shirt every day. We pre-recorded this section because I am actually out of the United States shooting some really cool stuff for our Seeker Stories channel. But we have another interview for you this week, and I think you're going to like it. It's about antimatter. If you don't know anything about antimatter, it's pretty much exactly like matter except that it doesn't seem to exist in our universe very much. We can make it, it famously powers Star Trek spaceships, but we don't make it quite like they do. The guy who makes it is coming up in this episode. It's his job at CERN, the Center for Nuclear Research in Europe, and he makes antimatter. It's really, really cool. We have a short interview that we're going to air with him. This is our only episode this week. I apologize for that. If you're upset about it, please tweet at me. You can also tweet at the show. I'm at Trace Dominguez. The show is at DNews. But I hope you enjoy it. Here is our trip to CERN to the Antimatter Factory. How can you not be excited? Uh, my name is Will Birchie. I'm a lecturer at the University of Manchester in England. I'm the technical coordinator for the Alpha Experiment here at CERN and uh, we're doing research into antimatter. So you're building or creating antimatter inside here? Absolutely, so this facility creates antimatter uh, using the particle beams at CERN. We convert protons into antiprotons. Um, we get other antimatter particles such as positrons um, by basically taking radioactive salt and pulling off decay products that come as those radioactive salts um, decay. And that gives us antimatter electrons. Um, we have antimatter protons that come from CERN. Uh, and then what we do is we trap them in our experiments and we can combine them together and form antihydrogen atoms, uh, which we're working to study the properties of. How do you trap them? Uh, it sounds easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two main ways in which you can trap uh, antimatter. Um, we start out. Uh, with the ingredients for antihydrogen, namely positrons and antiprotons, um, those particles are charged, and we trap charged particles in our experiments using uh, magnetic fields and electric fields in a particular configuration. Uh, however, what we ultimately want to study in our experiment um, are the properties of antihydrogen atoms, specifically antihydrogen. This is a neutral atom, and we can't trap those in the same way that we trap charged particles. Mm. Um, they behave like little tiny refrigerator magnets, and consequently, we basically have to arrange uh, a magnetic field geometry that looks kind of like a bathtub. Oh. So the antihydrogen atoms basically sit in a magnetic bathtub or magnetic bottle, but it's really actually physically shaped like a bathtub. Huh, and, and I assume just much smaller. <laughs> uh, it's, it's small, but it's not that small. It's about the size of sort of a two liter Coke bottle. Oh, okay. And so you gather them in here and hold them for how long? Uh, so we have demonstrated being able to hold on to the antihydrogen atoms for about 15 minutes. Um, we could probably hold on to them longer. I, I think the experiments that we're interested in performing, we don't actually have to have the atoms for more than a few hundred seconds. Uh, so it's certainly been true that um, antimatter has been held by experiments here for many, many months. And uh, indeed, one of the experiments has a collection of antiprotons that uh, they grabbed onto sometime early last year, and they've actually still have the same antiprotons that they've had the whole time. Whoa. So uh, there's not really, so far there, it, there is a limit of how long you can hold them, but it seems like it could be for a long time once you figured it out. That's right. We can hold it on basically as long as we care to hold on to the antimatter for. Um, it's just a question of, you know, whenever we decide we need to do something better with our time. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens if you take a collection of anti-hydrogen and you put it all together? What is that? What is it? Does it look like hydrogen? Uh, so in principle, according to our theoretical understanding, uh, if we had a collection of anti-hydrogen, it should look the same as a collection of hydrogen atoms. However, we are trying to find out whether, in fact, that's true by measuring the properties of antihydrogen atoms. Um, one question that we're addressing in the alpha experiment is what color these antihydrogen atoms are. Um, we're doing that by irradiating these antihydrogen atoms with lasers, and we look and see what frequencies of light these atoms will absorb. And according to theory, the frequencies that these atoms absorb uh, should exactly be the same as those that anti, uh, sorry, hydrogen atoms absorb. Uh, however, 
since there's such a large difference in the quantity of antimatter in the universe versus matter, namely the matter, uh, the universe seems to be largely composed of matter. Seems like out here. Yeah. That's quite a bit. Um, of it. We have reason to believe that there's some difference that we don't understand yet between matter and antimatter. And so our route to try and find this out is to investigate properties such as the color of these antihydrogen atoms and okay, look so for differences. What, what color is hydrogen? Is that a dumb question? I feel like it. Yeah, I don't no, know so what color hydrogen is. If I, if I had, a, <laughs> uh, if I had a, a glass bulb full of hydrogen gas, I could make it like a neon lamp. Um, if you had a hydrogen lamp, it would be a sort of pinkish purplish color. Hmm. Uh, whereas, so ideally, anti-hydrogen would be the same color? That's right. Yeah, yeah. but we don't know that yet. But we don't know that yet. Ooh. Exactly. That's right. We're trying to find out if that's true. Cool. So, is there other things antimatter can be used for? I mean, famously, Star Trek uses antimatter. <laughs> that's, so. that's right. Uh, so, commercially, uh, antimatter is actually commonly used in uh, a lot of medical techniques, mm. such as uh, positron emission tomography. Um, this is a technique that's often used in um, procedures for, I think, cancer diagnostics. You ingest a drug that has some radioisotope that decays and produces a positron. And that positron is now inside your body and it immediately meets its twin, its matter twin, the electron. They combine, they annihilate, and they produce x-rays. And these x-rays are then imaged by a big camera uh, that can locate where that radioisotope went. And so you can image tumors and things of this nature using positron emission tomography. Um, Antiprotons are not produced very many places. At the moment, uh, CERN is the unique facility in the world that's even making antiprotons, hmm. let alone slowing them down uh, for fundamental research. There aren't exactly commercial applications for antiprotons, though uh, research has been conducted here uh, to investigate whether antiprotons could be used for, directly for uh, cancer treatment in the way that protons are used for cancer treatment. So there could be a future uh, yeah. for that kind of uh, use for antiprotons. How did you get to make antimatter? How did I get to make yeah. antimatter? What, what, what brought you to the antimatter factory? Uh, so I started out my physics career in Berkeley, in California, and I was studying uh, the dynamics of trapped charged particles. Uh, specifically, I was looking at clouds of trapped electrons, and it turns out that uh, the details of how you trap and hold charged particles um, come right into play when you start doing antimatter research, uh, because all of these start out as charged particles. Uh, and so, towards the end of my PhD, um, my advisor, he got involved in this experiment uh, because we felt that the approach that was sort of proposed by the field as to how to go from the point where you were making antihydrogen to actually trapping it, that the conventional approach to that just wasn't going to work mm -hmm. because the types of traps that people wanted to build to hold antihydrogen atoms wouldn't be compatible with the charged particles uh, that we were using to create the antihydrogen. Uh, and so we built a prototype experiment in our lab at Berkeley to basically demonstrate that there was this problem and uh, to test a proposed alternative. Uh, and that turned out to be very successful. And so the sort of end of my PhD kind of dovetailed into the beginning of a project here. And uh, I got the opportunity to come uh, to CERN as a student and basically spend sort of a summer working on the project. Uh, and I just really loved uh, the environment here and um, the sort of interdisciplinary nature of this work. Uh, and so after my PhD, I started a postdoc with a university in the UK and Wales, uh, in Swansea, and uh, I've just kind of continued on. There's lots and lots of different problems associated with this field of research, and so there's always something new uh, yeah. to work on, and it's really interesting. How did you, uh, I guess even before that, how did you get into charged particles? Like what was... Did you like, uh, get shocked as a kid or something did I get and shocked how as a it kid. worked? Or? Um, well, I always kind of had a fascination for fluids. And, uh, you know, it's the sort of thing you're a kid and you're doing the dishes and you're pouring things and making them ring and stuff like that. And I just, I loved fluids and I liked fluid dynamics. And uh, it turns out that clouds of charged particles behave like fluids. And uh, for me, I it was a very interesting experimental 
program that was being run at Berkeley that was looking at the dynamics of these sort of charged fluids, uh, which are incidentally called plasmas. These are pure electron plasmas in this case. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's basically how I got into that field of research. I actually cool. pretty focused on that kind of category of research. And I mean, there were other, other things to consider, but it was, a really, it was a really nifty field and a really cool experiment. And well, I was like, all right, I want to go work on that. So that's, that's, that's pretty that's awesome. I got into it. I mean, and now you get to work at a place with a giant sign that says antimatter factory on it. Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> I mean, from fluids to antimatter, okay. But there is a road that connects those two <laughs> points. It's yeah. almost coherent. Anyway. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank <laughs> thanks, guys. Apologies again for this short week. We will try to never do this again to you. I really hope you enjoyed the interview with this guy from the Antimatter Factory. It's so cool. I should be back very soon so that we can get more D News Plus out into your faces. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't watched some of our old episodes and you want some more D News Plus, we've got episodes all the way back, stretching more than a year of series about Mars and human habitation of the planet and, you know, life and death and blood and all sorts of crazy stuff. So go back and find one of those episodes. Let us know down in the comments if you enjoyed this short interview and if you want us to do more interviews. And also let us know if you have a favorite D News Plus series that you've listened to or watched because, hey, we need to know what you like so we can do more of it. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Trace. Come find me on Twitter at Trace Dominguez. See you next time.